Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham. This is Biochemistry One, and this is the second of two lectures on fatty acid breakdown. You recall in the last lecture we looked at how uh, fatty acids are absorbed from the GI tract during digestion, distributed uh, to tissues, and now we're going to focus on how tissues make use of those fatty acids as an energy source. Okay, so remember, as we said uh, in the previous uh, theory segment that triglycerides are the major human fat used for catabolism, that is to store calories that can be consumed either to generate energy for movement and thinking, for example, or energy necessary for uh, an subsequent anabolic building projects. So this, as a reminder, is just a, a, a triacylglycerol or a triglyceride where three fatty acids are esterified to the three hydroxyl groups on uh, glycerol, as we talked about I in detail in earlier occasions. And we're going to look today at how those fatty acids get used as energy sources. So triglycerides are, uh, fatty acids are released from them by lipases, as we've talked about previously. Then those free fatty acids are subject to beta oxidation. That's the process that's going to that's going to occupy most of our attention today, the process of beta oxidation. The reason that we're focused on that, even though that's only a small fraction of the energy that fatty acids yield, is because the end product of beta oxidation is acetyl-CoA. Beta oxidation, as you'll see, goes on in the mitochondria, and just like the citric acid cycle. And so its end product is acetyl-CoA, just like the end product of the processing of pyruvate uh, from glycolysis in the mitochondria to enter the citric acid cycle as well. So we, in fact, the final, the majority of energy derived from uh, a fatty acid uh, catabolism is generated by running acetyl-CoA through the citric acid cycle that we've already seen. So in fact, what we're concerned with here is that intermediate step, taking fatty acids, going through beta oxidation, and turning them into acetyl-CoA. And we'll focus on that process. We'll also see that that process yields some energy in its own right, in addition to the energy, of course, that the acetyl-CoA uh, is going to generate as it cycles through the citric acid cycle, just like glycolytic acetyl-CoA does. OK, so this is a, a sort of complicated overall summary that we'll return to on various occasions in this lecture and also in the subsequent lecture when we talk about rebuilding fatty acids, their anab anabolism. And it symbolizes uh, two cells. The one at the bottom is a, is a lipocyte, uh, an adipocyte, which is uh, uh, going to, under appropriate circumstances, release fatty acids into the circulatory system. The cell at top is a liver cell, which is a cell which might consume those fatty acids, but in fact, and, and you run them through beta oxidation, but as we'll also see, are, is able to uh, participate in um, uh, transforming fatty acyl uh, energy into something called ketone bodies that we'll return to a little bit later. So these lipocytes or adipocytes uh, uh, hydrolyze uh, in response to appropriate signals, some of which we'll talk about in later segments. They will release fatty acids back into the cir circulatory system. Um, the uh, serum albumin, the, the extremely abundant protein that uh, makes up uh, the largest, the, the most abundant protein in serum uh, has a multiple fatty acid binding sites and acts as a as a serum fatty acid transporter, and it that is hand that it it fa uh, uh, um, uh, uh, albumin uh, transfers its fatty acids, gives them up to cells and tissues as the as the serum runs through the capillary networks, and there are uh, apparently uh, uh, transporter systems on the cell surface which bring fatty acids into the cell, and then there's the fatty acid binding proteins that we talked about before. Notice in this diagram the fatty acid is a stick diagram, yellow stick in the middle, and the surrounding uh, uh, fatty acid binding protein uh, uh, scounces it and renders it much more soluble in the cytosol of cells, and that fatty acid binding protein will deliver the fatty acid to where it's going, uh, 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 often to uh, ultimately to the mitochondrion, as you'll see in a few minutes. Okay, then it's taken up and converted into a acyl-CoA. In other words, the fatty acid is connected to CoA in the same way that acetate is connected to, to CoA in an acetyl-CoA subunit. So this is an acyl-CoA, but it's a much longer and larger acid, a fatty acid, not just acetic acid, not just acetate. And then that is transported in a rather convoluted way, as we'll see in a moment, into the mitochondrion, and it's then subject to beta oxidation inside the mitochondrion. That will be our focus in the next couple of minutes. So let's look at first at how fatty acids are mobilized from the free fatty acid state to a, the state, the CoA acyl state, the acyl-CoA state, in uh, prepared for beta oxidation. So 
we're again looking at this process that begins in the in the cytosol and let's now zero in on the details on the screen here so what you'll notice is that the fatty acid the, this is a um, uh, process in which the uh, uh, fatty acid is going to be ultimately created, uh, converted into an acyl-CoA. And so the free fatty acid in a process catalyzed by enzymes that we're not indicating here, the uh, 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 oxygen in the carboxylate group uh, executes an, uh, a nucleophilic attack on, notice it is the alpha phosphate of ATP. So that's a little unusual. We've seen before where the hydrolysis of the uh, beta-gamma uh, uh, phosphate that releasing the gamma phosphate occurs. In this case, we're going to release both the gamma and beta phosphate as pyrophosphate, as we'll see in a moment. And that yields a, uh, an intermediate in which um, the uh, fatty acid is, uh, in an acyl, uh, is an acyl linkage to the uh, uh, to uh, AMP, adenosine monophosphate. But notice that that process also releases inorganic phosphate, sometimes called pyrophosphate, and that, that the uh, high energy bond in that uh, double pyrophosphate and hydride uh, compound is also hydrolyzed by inorganic pyrophosphatase, so that you're hydrolyzing two um, anhydride bonds here. This is, in other words, an extremely a a exergonic process. It, it, it proceeds very efficiently toward the right, that is net synthesis of um, uh, acyl-CoA. And here uh, is the uh, uh, the intermediate, uh, the uh, AMP intermediate. Uh, then an enzyme catalyzes an attack by the a nucleophilic attack by the sulfur on coenzyme A onto the carbonyl carboxy uh, uh, carbon, uh, producing the uh, acyl uh, um, CoA process at upper the comp output at the upper right, and of course the hydrolyzing releasing the AMP completing the hydrolysis of the uh, uh, adenosine intermediates. Okay, that's how we, uh, that's the first step in mobilization. That produces acyl-CoA. So let's say it's palmitic uh, acid. It will be palmityl-CoA. And in fact, you'll see these enzymes that we'll talk about today often named that way because palmitic acid was often used in the experimental systems for their discovery, even though these uh, uh, acyl-CoA synthases will often accept other amino acids, not just palm palmitic acid. The, but our next problem is that this as, uh, uh, acyl-CoA, though it's an essential substrate for mitochondrial beta oxidation, it's made first in the cytosol, and it can't pass the mitochondrial membrane. So there's, in fact, a slightly uh, complicated way in which it gets in to the mitochondrion. So there is a transesterification reaction with a compound that you'll see at the lower left here, uh, 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 carnitine. Okay. So uh, carni in fact, at the upper left is the carnitine compound itself, and at the lower left is the transacylation product, the, uh, the acyl carnitine. Notice the carnitine, carnitine has a quaternary amine in it, very different structure than CoA. Notice that it has that hydroxyl group symbolized in blue here at the top. That's going to be the acceptor for the transacetylation uh, uh, reaction, uh, producing the acyl carnitine reaction. So if you started with uh, palmitine CoA at the upper right, you'd end up with... Uh, 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 palmitil carnitine at the lower left. Now the reason that helps us is that mitochondria have a specific transporter system for acyl carnitine that it will uptake, that will uh, pump in this acyl carnitine. And here is a cartoon of that. Notice the carnitine palmitil transferase that we just saw about a moment ago that transfers the fatty acid, palmitic acid in this case, from CoA to carnitine, creating the carnitine uh, acyl carnitine at the bottom, and then this transporter symbolizes the large green uh, glob in the middle of the image that you can see is will now exchange an acyl uh, carnitine going in for a free carnitine coming out. It's what's called an antiporter. You notice at the top the car free carnitine is moving out at the same time a molecule of acyl carnitine is moving in. Then there's a mitochondrial. Uh, carnitine palmitil transferase, which will take, will, will catalyze the energetically neutral reverse reaction of this, transferring the acyl group from carnitine back onto CoA, creating free carnitine to go back out and complete the cycle, of course. And it, there is, again, a second uh, uh, isozyme, uh, isoform of the enzyme that catalyzes this. Reaction.